today I've come here to do some time travel with you. Yeah, and we're gonna start for, from a cold day in February, year 1600, it's dawn, and we are here. This is Campo dei Fiori, it's a famous square near Piazza Navona in Rome, and we all know this square because of the lively atmosphere and the colorful markets huddled around the statue of Giordano Bruno, who is probably one of the most courageous uh, thinkers of the Renaissance. But on the 16th of February, year 1600, the crowd is gathering here around Giordano Bruno for a very different reason. It's, first of all, not a statue yet. It's alive, but not for very long. It's about to get burnt at the stake for heresy. And on multiple counts, mind you, it was a supporter and he also extended the Copernicus heliocentric model. So the Earth was no longer a fixed point in the middle of the universe, but just one of other planets, you know, running around the sun. And if that wasn't enough, well, he also suggested the idea that there are multiple worlds. So there are multiple universes with their own sun, many planets around all of those suns, and some of these suns might even resemble our own inhabited Earth. I mean, you can imagine what that did at the time. But to us, this is kind of what we now understand as the multiverse. And in fact, much of this stuff is hardly controversial for us raised after Einstein and quantum physics. And yet, 16th century Italy, these ideas were like absolutely un unforgivable departure from the dominant paradigm, which in that, at that time was set by the Catholic teachings. Uh, so, what I find interesting is the, the actual word heresy. Although uh, we know this word as, uh, you know, with a negative feeling and a quite sense of disapproval, heresy from its origin in Greek was a quite neutral term. And in fact, it, uh, it signified choice. So it speaks of the, your choices and how you direct your life, your philosophy of life, basically. So how wild that such a little word would become so highly flammable to actually land someone at the stake. And I feel very grateful that fortunately we don't burn people at the stake anymore. But don't be fooled, those who are at variance with the uh, conventional wisdom, those are the ideas, the explanation, the uh, expert opinion that uh, everyone, the majority, accept as to be true, uh, are still getting burnt, maybe not at the stake, but certainly on the job market, and they're still feeling the heat of those flames <laughs> potentially burning down their careers. So the real question would be, so why do it? Why taking the risk? And well, because not doing it is actually far more dangerous. We would stop imagining other possibility. We would stop making other worlds possible. So let's go and do some more time travel. This time, we are in more recent time. We are on the Greybury Reef. It's about 20 years ago, and I'm a doctoral student. And I'm spending a lot of time underwater, possibly a bit too much time underwater. And I'm studying these uh, yellowfish. Specifically, I'm interested in maternal effects. This is uh, a reference to non-genetic inheritance. Or in other words, the, the effects that moms have on the offspring's phenotype, so the physical form, the development, the behavior, independent of their genes. Now, at the time, for example, some of the things that I found was that uh, moms that, comes, that are experiencing stressful environment will more likely produce babies which have like asymmetrical wonky ears. Now, baby fish with wonky ears are not deaf, but their ability to tune into reef-associated sounds, which are so fundamental for their early survivorship, is compromised. What that means, in other words, is that the mums from healthy environments are the ones that are going to contribute the most to the replenishment of the reef. So, to suggest at the time I wasn't the only one suggesting the maternal effects were important, and in fact, many others were looking across all sorts of animal groups and also plants, and what the, the bottom line was the maternal effects were arising as a very powerful evolutionary force that can do two important things, facilitate adaptation and also buffer against adverse conditions. Now, to suggest at the time that you had organisms which were affected by their own genes and their own environments, as well as the, the environment and the behavior of mom and even grandma, well, 
that would have landed you at the stake. But as I said, we don't burn people at the stake, fortunately. But we still use bad names for those who try. And so at the time, the name that would be used uh, for, for someone like me would be like, you've been Lamarckian, which was a shorthand for saying, you have no idea what you're talking about. And uh, this is a time where the dominant mantra still is, everything is in the genes, everything is explained by the genes. But when those precious genes didn't explain everything, and when even mapping entire genomes left unanswered questions, then classical genetics had to rethink, and I would say rebrand itself. And the rebranding is something actually you are very well aware of, because the new name is epigenetic. And epi is the bit that I'm interested in, because it refers to the effects of maternal environment, or things like maternal behavior, which are literally on top, in addition, beyond the genes and genetic inheritance. So as you can see, over time, what was heretical turned out to be just uh, new, new knowledge. Now, let's do some more time travel, and we're going to go back about uh, roughly 10 years from now. Uh, I am now a duly trained and certified research scientist. <laughs> I have my PhD, and I'm like, my, my career is in full swing, and then things happen, and I was forced by events to take a new perspective about my work. And in the process of twisting and turning, I discovered plants. I didn't really know anything much about plants, so I started from those questions that I was interested in. So I looked at behavior, question of intelligence, question of communications. And as, of course, as you know, when we search, we find. And for example, I, I demonstrated how this plant, Mimosa pudica, also known as the sensitive plant, can remember for a long time a disturbance and can also learn to ignore it when it proves to be totally inconsequential. And it, this was such a groundbreaking finding that Michael Pollan actually, there, <laughs> Michael Pollan actually featured it as the intelligent plant in one of his major articles for The New Yorker. But mind you, uh, Mimosa is actually not the only intelligent plant that I know. Uh, the peas, for example, are very smart too. And in fact, uh, some of my research demonstrated that they can learn pretty much as your puppy dog would. And just like your puppy dog, the pea can learn to predict and expect something like dinner, in the case of a plant, light, even if dinner is not even present anywhere in the environment. Both the plant and the dog do this by learning the relationship between dinner and other cues in their environment. And this is a higher level of learning. Of course, what this speaks of is actually the mental cognitive capacities of plants, which I remind you do not have brains and do not have neurons, and yet they're doing this. And of course, for some, still this... Uh, heretical, again, it gets a bit boring. <laughs> um, but despite this, the field of plant cognition, because that's his new name, uh, is actually uh, being taken around the world now, and several labs are working on this. I know plenty of colleagues who are. So I didn't stop there, of course. Uh, and I thought, well, what is the point of all this learning if you actually can't share what you've learned? So I was also interested in plant communication and specifically the relationship between sound and plants. A relationship which is well understood and appreciated in indigenous context. But for Western science, I think the most colleagues thought that I was actually uh, doing this. So this is some of the baggage that we had to carry from the 70s. And the only problem with this is that although big claims were made at the time, there wasn't scientific evidence to support them. So nobody wanted to touch it. And in fact, it was quite heretical to do so. But the interesting part of that is that when you actually do, what you find is that uh, your, your, your plants actually produce a lot of sound. This is, for example, the sound of a little corn seedlings recorded in a lab with laser technology. And not only plants are using and, and producing their own sound, so they have their own voices, what they're actually doing as well is responding and listening to the sound around them. In my own research, I demonstrated that they can find water by just listening to the sound of it alone. And other colleagues have also demonstrated now that they can listen to the sound of potential predators or the arrival of bees and pol potential pollinators. So the field that only 10 years ago was kind of heretical, you don't want to touch it, now again has become something that is 
quite common, and, uh, and many labs around the world are doing the plant bioacoustics. So, no longer an heresy, I would say. <laughs> what have I learned from all of these experiences? And this is what I really come to share with you. Well, I learned that we need heresy more than ever. And this is because I think the heresy is the place where we are gonna find the solution and the innovation that we're looking for in terms of the big global ecological crisis that we are facing. Because those kind of solution and innovation do not come from the orthodoxy. They do not come from those very uh, well manicured landscapes of the expected. They come from the unexpected. They come from the not knowing. And in my own career, I learned that to be invited into this garden of not knowing, you have to surrender to not knowing and be okay with that. And um, in this process, I've learned a few important things. I learned that everyone, plant, animal, they're all listening to the sounds of around the world. They're all listening and responding to those sounds, and the information encoded in those sounds can be shared across generations. And as I pointed out to you before in the case of my fish, this sharing can facilitate adaptation and buffer against adverse conditions. So we have a very important tool here. Now, then I started thinking, what if we have been literally listening to the solution all this time? So you might wonder, oh, I have a proposal for you. How about we stop playing God and we start playing midwives? Yes. Because we already know from our own premature human babies, when we put them in incubator, that the sound of mums is important and it can influence and support survivorship. So how about we use the maternal soundscape to support the survivorship of all species across all environments? This is my next heresy, and I call it Resonant Earth. And the point of Resonant Earth is exactly to develop those tools, those incubators that will allow us to use sounds to regenerate the entire planet. And if you think that this is heretical, it's, oh, it's too big, it's too crazy, excellent, hopefully so, because as I said, I, I, I like heresy. And, uh, and if you're wondering whether it's gonna work, I have good news for you too, I don't know. And in the not knowing, it is in this not knowing that the success of Resonant Earth actually is possible. Ultimately, what we are really, the ultimate goal here for me is we need to really heal our minds so that we can dream and imagine new possible worlds. And we can also inspire our hearts so that we can really reconnect the spirit of our humanity, our beautiful humanity, with a sense of reverence and a sense of reciprocity to our life. So you wonder if it's gonna work? I think so, but I don't know. We can only try to make it possible. <laughs>